Good morning. All right, we're going to continue this morning. Doctrine of Angels, otherwise known as Angelology. I feel this is, I like handouts and charts and things. Sometimes they're useful tools. And so grab one, pass it along, look around when you're toward the end. Make sure, if you would, that everybody got one personally or to share what have you. And if I need more, then I'll, I'll do it. We could take a quick look at a couple. This, this is, um, I don't know who originally made this Angel Truths chart. There's a couple things I would I would address on here and and um, vary a little bit on it. We can go over that real quick, but uh, kind of an interesting topic so far, right? This doctrine of angels, and um, so what we want to do, we're going to continue this. Um, Greg gave us three weeks of a lot of uh, introduction and general information on angels and and their types and so forth, and. Um, I was I had my notes prepared to start last week, and so there's going to be some maybe overlap mention of uh, some information that's similar to what um, Greg covered. And then when we get toward the end and we get into future weeks, we're going to be getting into angels in the New Testament, and then we'll also get into um, Satan's fall and the demons, and then we'll also look at uh, future what happens with angels and demons in the future because as you know and Greg mentioned a couple times is in, in the book of Revelation as we know there is a ton of stuff about angelic activity or demonic activity in Daniel's 70th week aka uh, the great tribulation or the tribulation week so we're going to get into all of that over the next weeks and feel free to shoot your hand up and I am invite that in fact ask questions and so forth and and I'll try not to get too far off on rabbit trails I like rabbit trails so uh, if I get too far you know I'll just look around if I, if I see too many glassy eyes then I'll know that okay I've I wandered too far but um, it's it's a fascinating subject as you know um, as you, I'm sure you're all aware there's a lot of really bad information out there on angels and it's just kind of a new agey kind of a thing and now, uh, as is kind of the bent of the charismatic movement as a whole, um, getting into all of the supernatural stuff and uh, glitter or gold falling from the rafters, all these kinds of things are all part and parcel of the kind of supernatural stuff that churches of that ilk like to get into. and dispense a lot of bad information and a lot of its heresy. So if you have questions about things like this and you want to bring it up, um, let's address it. Because if you have questions, probably somebody you know is going to have questions as well. So I don't want to rush anybody through any of this material. Let's just, let's just get through here. And um, I think it's fascinating. So without further ado, has everybody got a copy of that General Angel Truths? Um, that we just handed out. Did everybody got a copy of that? Take a quick look at the first paragraph here. I, I would change something. There's a couple things I would change. This is for you to hopefully get you excited to research more on your own and to be as the Berean and even double check everything I say because I've been known to get things wrong every once in a while. You know, you remember that time, honey? Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, um, yeah, and then I figured out, oh, I was wrong, I was right. Um, it says here in, in the fourth point in here, it says, angels are spirit beings, and it lists Hebrews 1.14, without physical bodies. Although they um, do not have physical bodies, they're still personalities and occasionally take on physical bodies. Though whether demonic beings take on physical form is debatable. Let's address that for, uh, right off the bat. Um, I don't think I would agree with this. Uh, I think there's confusion, you might agree, when we're talking about the spiritual versus spirit. And we tend to think spirit is like a ghost. It's incorporeal. You go up to touch somebody and your hand's gonna go right through them or something. 
spirit beings. We have, and we'll, we'll find some passages in here. Um, for instance, um, turn real quick, if you would, to Genesis 19. Genesis 19. There's so much that kicks off in the book of Genesis, right? And uh, Genesis 19, let's start with, with verse 15. As morning dawned, the angels urged Lot, saying, Up, take your wife and your two daughters who are here, lest you be swept away in the punishment of the city. We know what this is about, right? Sodom and Gomorrah is about ready to be toast. But he lingered. So the men seized him and his wife and his two daughters by the hand of the Lord being merciful to him. And they brought him out and set him outside the city. So there you have physical contact with angels. So when we talk about the spiritual versus physical I think what we need to do is we need to differentiate between physical and physical. By that I mean flesh and blood like humans are. Um, how about think in terms of Jesus when he resurrected. What did he do when he appeared in the upper room with the disciples and he sat down with them and ate, right? Now, he was, as the term said, um, he says a, a spirit doesn't have flesh and bone, as you see that I have. So there's question and there's debate. Well, is there actual blood in the body? Do we need the hydraulics in our bodies to function at the point where we have glorified bodies like Jesus did? And there's debate over that. Um, and there's some interesting arguments on both sides of that. But clearly, we're changed completely when we get to a point where we have glorified bodies. Jesus was recognizable, but did Jesus look exactly like he did when he died? Uh, he, you know, had changed. He chooses to keep his scars, and he told Thomas, put your hand here. You know, spirit doesn't have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And there's a lot of reasons for why he would do that, of course. So for one thing, is you, it's to verify that it's him. But I think he wears um, the scars of redemption like a badge, right? Um, love and honor for us. That doesn't mean that we are, we are going to have scars and things when we get our glorified bodies. Of course, as the old saying goes, that ain't gospel. I mean, I can't swear that that's the case, right? We, we don't know. Um, but the physical things change. Jesus, when he went up on the Mount of Transfiguration, you know, we tend to think of, we hear these stories about the rapture and we hear these stories about, you know, as the legend goes, oh, you know, we'll pass up into the sky and we'll be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye as 1 Corinthians 15 you know, your glasses and your pacemakers and your fillings are all going to fall on the ground, that kind of thing. And then, well, I don't know, we're going to go up naked or what? What's going on here? But what we see, though, is Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. What happened to him and what happened to his clothing? It's, a, it's like his clothing was, tran were, was, his robe was transformed as well, right? Next thing you know, he's glowing and there's this aura about him, if you can call it aura. It's such a new age term. I apologize for that. A glory cloud, whatever. It's, he was glowing and light was emanating from him. And he's up there with a couple other guys and he looked a little different. He was physically different. And then he came back, boom, he's back and he's right back where he was wearing his regular clothes again. God can do whatever he wants. So what, whatever that's going to look like, I don't think it's necessarily going to be where we go up and, and clothes get left behind and everything like that. Again, um, it ain't gospel. I, you know, we don't know exactly what that's going to look like. We have um, Mount of Transfiguration. What happened during um, Christ's ascension. Well, there's some details about that, but not a lot is about what he's wearing or whatever. So, um, with the rapture, 
the indicators are folks would seem to make it seem like uh, you might be changed or you might become a spirit and so you drop out of all your clothes, your, your change, and you go up into, into heaven. Um, the nature of the rapture is we're changed in a moment and it's um, more like the resurrection. Let's, um, what I want to do too is let's take a look. This is the other, other part of this. And this is, this is connected because the nature of angels and what they're like can be different depending on who you talk to and, and the difference, the distinction between spiritual and spirit. Spiritual. Um, there are verses in the Bible that say now, because we've changed, that we are spiritual. We're, and spiritual has to do more of uh, to do with your, your character and your position with Christ than necessarily um, the nature of your body. So, so we see some interesting things there. Let, turn to um, probably the best passage for all this is getting into a resurrection passage. So turn, if you will, to 1 Corinthians 15. And um, I need someone who wants to read a good chunk. Let's say verses, um, 1 Corinthians 15, verses 35. I want to go all the way down through... Um, may as well make it but verse 55. So 35 through 55. Who's brave enough to read that? Speak up nice and loud. You got that? But someone will ask, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body do they come? You foolish person. What you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And what you sow is not the body that is to be, but a bare kernel perhaps of wheat or of some other grain. But God gives it a body as he has chosen, and to each kind of seed its own body. For not all flesh is the same, but there is one kind for humans, another for animals, another for birds, and another for fish. There are heavenly bodies and earthly bodies, but the glory of the heavenly is of one kind, and the glory of the earthly is of another. There is one glory of the sun, and another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars, for star differs from star in glory. So it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable, what is raised is imperishable. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. Thus it is written, The first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. But it is not the spiritual that is first, but the natural, and then the spiritual. The first man was from the earth, a man of dust. The second man is from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are of the dust. And as is the man of heaven, so also are those who are of heaven. Just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable, and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death! Where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? So fascinating, isn't it? So I think, um, you know, we haven't personally, most of us probably experienced this distinction here that it's talking about. When we got angels that are spiritual or described as spirit, but yet physical, we got the last Adam being Jesus, he became a life-giving spirit. 
yet he told Thomas, touch and feel me. A spirit doesn't have flesh and bones as you see that I have. So he's spiritual. He's a different nature of his body than the bodies we have now. So now we get, get into realms here where there's a lot of overlap with, um, you know, uh, presupposition and speculation of, of things that we just, we absolutely can't swear to, things that we don't know. We have indicators in the scripture. That's all we have. And really, that's all we should have and all we should go by. But, you know, what is the mechanism? What does that look like? You know, we know Jesus was up there in the upper room and all of a sudden he just popped in there with the guys, right? And he startled them. And he's saying, fear not, it's just me. Um, and you have uh, angels who aren't there. Next thing you know, they're there talking to, uh, you know, Isaac, talking to Abraham. Or um, you have an angel coming into Daniel and he was in flight. So sometimes they're in flight. Sometimes they just appear. So somehow... There's a realm out there we can call a spiritual realm or a supernatural realm. So in addition to the realm that we live in right now, the physical realm where we are flesh and blood and bone, um, there's something else out there. This isn't new to us. I don't know if, if, if you've thought much about what the nature of that is. I and mean, we all think about it a little bit and how we might change. And we all think about getting our glorified bodies. But what is the nature of spiritual? What is the nature of the next life. And so there's another realm out there. We talk about um, heaven uh, above and we talk about um, hell beneath. So we talk about locality and things like this. So somehow out there in another realm and another dimension um, it are, is, is a, a supernatural realm that is well, we could say it's God's realm. It's an angelic realm where they dwell and they get around and we know that there's a warfare going on and all, all of this stuff we get from the scriptures, but we don't know the nature of that um, because we can't see it unless the Lord, by granting permission to these beings, permits them to reveal themselves in some way. It's very fascinating, isn't it? And they interact with us a lot for the bad, and for the good, we don't know all that about, but the Bible does tell us about a lot of the bad stuff that happens in the spiritual warfare we're in. And we get toward the very end, Greg will be addressing some of that and how we handle some of, some of that dynamic of uh, spiritual warfare. So we will eventually get to that. So mean, mean, meantime, you know, looking at this, um, where the angels dwell and what they behave like, what they look like and, and things, it's fascinating. And a lot of it is speculation. So on some level, it is physical. You've got beings up there before the throne and they don't have their glorified bodies yet. You know, saints who've gone on before, but somehow they have robes. So how, what does that look like? How does that work? And so we have indicators of that in Revelation 4 and 5. Um, very interesting. So it, here's an interesting thing for, for you nerds who are interested in that kind of thing and might be interested. Um, but physicists... Even Christian ones have figured out that, well, mathematically, they can demonstrate that there are a minimum of something on the order of 10 different dimensions. They don't know the exact nature of it, but mathematics show, and I don't know how the math does that, ask a physicist, but they figure that out and they say those other dimensions out there. Some will say, well, the fourth and the fifth dimension, you know, fifth dimension is a band, right? From back in the 60s. No, but the fourth and fifth dimension is um, space and time or space time. And they'll argue about what these look like. But we do have a clue a little bit that we can appreciate and understand um, about what that might be like from their perspective. Because when you think about it, um, we have difficulty comprehending what we're designed to understand and something that we haven't experienced. You know, so you go back in time, you see the Old Testament prophets and the New Testament prophets, and they're describing things, poor guys, in ways that they're, they're like trying to understand. Well, uh, they're firing arrows at each other. And there were missiles, maybe. 
you know, when it's not a vision, it may be the Lord's actually showing them what's going on. And so they're saying arrows because that's all they understand. They're, they're trying to comprehend things that just are outside their experience. So we're similar. So the way I heard a physicist describe it is that, you know, if you got, if you've got flat land and there are beings living on flat land like this, they, they live in a two dimensional world. So you can see forward, back, side to side, and that's it. There's no third dimension. You can't see up, you can't see down. They might theoretically know that that exists, but they don't have any experience with it. So what are they going to see if you have flat land, and then somebody puts their hand right there, or their fingertip right in the middle of their land? All of a sudden, there's a wall there that's this wide. That's all they kind of see. You know, it's, it's flat, so it's one dimensional. There's a line there, and they can't see. And if, if you were to Put your hand through that, all of a sudden the shapes would change and things because your hand is going wider, wider, and then narrow. And the, so their perspective is, wow, what's happening? And we can see flat land. If you, if you had a village of flat people down there and you took your pencil, graphite, and you drew a square around them, all of a sudden they'd have a wall around themselves. And they can't see. They might feel kind of secure and protected because there's a wall around them. We can see down into their world, though. Now... Physicists say, similarly, when you get in the upper dimensions, our third dimension is that they can see down, if you can put it that way, into our dimension. And that's how, uh, you know, there are walls and things where you can hide. Uh, they can see down into our three-dimensional world. So that's how, um, you know, you can kind of look at these upper dimensions and how they pop in and pop out. They can see things we're doing, they can see where we're at, and we can't see them. It's like the flat people cannot see us. So anyway, the physicists say that that's kind of what we can understand and comprehend about upper dimensions. Now, God is everywhere. He commands all the dimensions. We don't know the full nature of that. We don't know. There's an angelic realm. There's a realm where the angels and demons interact and they're warring and fighting. And there's a, uh, at some point, we know uh, Greg got into a little bit um, from Job chapter 1 and Job chapter 2, and we know this also from um, Revelation 12, that Satan will go before the throne and he'll accuse the saints just like he did with Job. So he has access by permission from God to access the throne and to accuse the saints. He's not omnipresent. He's not all-powerful, anything like that. He's just another being, and he's an angelic being. So he's he has severe restrictions, although he's more powerful than we are, more knowledgeable than we are. So what does that look like? Um, is it all, do they all share the same dimensional realm? We don't know. That's all speculation. Have fun with that. But it's something to think about, so we know that it's out there because we interact with it. We have interactions with it on a regular basis. So when angels pop in and angels pop out, um, at least we can understand that somehow there's, they're interdimensional beings. Now, this is what's interesting, too. I don't know if you guys are watching some of the news about some of the exploration they're having, they're having right now into the problem of where is our money going into this bottomless hole of a pit investigating UFOs, or as they call them now, UAPs. And we have in, here in Tennessee uh, a senator, I believe he's a senator, no, I think he's a congressman, who is all over this because he wants to know, okay, you guys keep denying that these things exist. Where's the money going? I want to know where the money's going. I don't care if they exist and if there's aliens on them or not. I know it's allocated. Money's going into this pit. Where's it going? So those in those circles who are investigating this who claim to have... Um, worked for, you know, the skunk works in all these different places and dealt with alien technology and so forth. They, most of them now are saying that they believe that they do exist. Um, you can call them aliens if they want, but a lot of them don't call them aliens. They call them interdimensional beings. And they'll say this. They say, because we don't always see where the, the UFOs, the Tic Tacs, flying saucers, whatever, the triangles, we don't see where they come from. We don't see them off in the distance in space and, oh, look, there's an armada circling around the moon and coming toward us. They're just all of a sudden here. Or they come from out of the ocean or what have you. 
So we, we can pretty safely deduce that there's something spiritual going on there, right? Part of the grand deception here, especially toward the end. So interdimensional beings for the purpose of deception. So, you know, put that in your hip pocket, consider that. But here's some other interesting dynamics to think about. Um, we here, we're, we're aware of from the New Testament um, that there can be demon possession. And how you can have a legion fitting into one person is, you know, that's like the, how many angels can dance on the head of a pin kind of a question. Uh, we don't, it's an interdimensional kind of a thing, how that works. Do we ever read in the Bible, understand anything at all about angelic possession? Has anybody ever been possessed by an angel to do something? You know, you'd be hard pressed to find anything in the scripture like that. So if that's not their nature, at least by permission, because angels are good angels and they behave and they follow God's structure he's put together, right? The demons are rebellious, so they do what they do by permission, but they do things that the other angels don't. Um, so there's all these interesting dynamics that you know, we're going to continue to get into, and we'll see some of these in, in the Old Testament. So I just wanted to correct and adjust and put in your mind um, the idea of what is uh, a physical body, or we can call it a temporal body, because these will be destroyed and remade, recreated, regenerated as something else in the future. What's well, a spiritual body as opposed to like a spirit body, the way we normally think of spirits, especially here in Western culture. So think about those things and what that might look like. So angels are, are spiritual beings created by God. They exist in a different order of um, creation than humans. Unlike humans, angels don't have temporal bodies and they're not subject to death and decay. Um, the primary purpose is to serve God and to carry out his will. And um, in a couple of weeks, we will be getting into the fall of angels and how that happened. Um, we already discussed um, in former weeks some of that about Lucifer, as we know him, Satan, in Isaiah and in Ezekiel, in his fall. So we'll get into a little bit more of that. So the concepts now of redemption and repentance, these are strictly human um, experiences, right? These are strictly for humans. And the angelic realm, there's demons fall, they fall, there's no redemption for them, there's no way back. That might explain why they're so all out when they decide to sin and they do some abhorrent things is because they have nothing to lose. They've already lost everything, right? Somebody asked me a question a while, a while back about, you know, do you think there's still angels falling? Well, the scripture doesn't really address anything like that. Um, angels are going to keep doing what angels do. The fall happened when the fall happened. Um, evidently, in the angelic realm, the fall happened a little bit sooner than the fall in the garden, right? How do we know this? Yeah, before Adam and Eve fell, the serpent was there. So, um, exactly when they have, I mean, we have um, Job 38. Who wants to read Job 38, verses 4 to 7? Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know, or who stretched the line upon it? On what were its bases sunk, or who laid its cornerstone, when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy? So a couple of weeks ago, Greg got into this a little bit, you know, about the, the sons of God. So God is creating, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. I, and I, I take that as an order of events kind of thing where the heavens and the heavenly realms and whatever those other dimensions are, he created that first, the heavens and then the earth. He created the heavens and, and we're in the third dimension of that part that he plugged us into, plugged the earth into and, and began creating that. Um, I 
believe it all happened in the order of, of it does in Genesis and approximately 6,000 years ago when it happened in six days and on the seventh day he rested. So there was a lot that seemed to happen that first day, right? And he no sooner creates the angels when you have an uprising. Um, and this is all by God's design. And that's another argument for another time and, and a lot of philosophizing on that. And, you know, it, it's, it's like the old argument about, well, you know, why did God make us to where we could sin? And there's answers to that. Um, but they, similarly, the answer is probably similar in some ways with the angelic beings. Timothy, Timothy, we're the elect angels? Yeah, there's yeah, a place that refers to elect angels. Yeah. Fascinating, isn't it? So you guys, get, I hope you guys are getting kind of fleshed out here as we go in the weeks of kind of best we can imagine with very little scripture to focus on it, what that realm looks like and how that behaves. And what we're going to be getting into really now is the interaction of those beings with us into our realm. And that's part of the intention of why God created them is for this interaction. We see, we know the name um, angel. We know it means messenger, but we also see uh, living creatures. Why are they called living creatures? Well, there's something that lives in uh, this other realm and they offer up praise for God. Um, I, I suppose they occasionally do things for God, do his bidding. But not all of them, I guess, are probably messengers. Um, some of them are exist for the purpose of praising God. And that's all they do all the time. Holy, 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 you know, and they praise God. That's, that's their function. So they aren't angels in the sense that they might be angelic beings. They live in the spiritual realm, but they aren't messengers. You know, messengers like an ambassador. Ambassadors for God to come to man to do his bidding, to pass on messages, that type of a thing. So it's, it's very fascinating. We find indicators in the scripture where um, there are chief angels or princes, sometimes the scripture will call them, that seem to be territorial. They've got areas they're in charge of. And apparently some of these carry that into, you know, some of the chief fallen angels are that way too. We have, in Daniel, most notably, we have uh, Gabriel on his way to talk to Daniel and the prince of Persia, Iran, interrupted him. We don't know how long that struggle went on, but he's trying to deliver this message and this being, this chief demon is hanging on to him, fighting him and trying to keep him from delivering this message to Daniel. And Michael had to come in. Now, Michael is identified in the scripture a lot, having, um, well, both... Michael and Gabriel, maybe this is the reason why we know their names, specifically their functions have to do with Israel. So we got Michael and Gabriel, and Michael is a chief angel who is seen and, and uh, portrayed to be over Israel. He uh, leads them in the wilderness. Um, in Revelation 12, we'll see God's you know, he, he's done. He says, okay, I've had enough of this. So we get into, um, you know, the tribulation is a seven-year period. In the middle of that is the great tribulation starts. You get to the middle of the tribulation, the great tribulation, and God says, all right, I've had it. Go take care of my light work for me, you know. So Michael steps down, and the, the angels, they wrestle with Satan, and they cast him down once and for all for heaven. Satan, he's got access now to the throne, so here's the thing where he's cast down. So um, he's a cherub. Um, evidently, he's got wings. Unless, you know, there's different types of cherubs, right? Uh, this is what's kind of odd. So I want to I point this out real quick. You know, we, we, I think it was last week, Greg, where you got into the Ark of the Covenant, the mercy seat, and what the cherubim looked like. Turn to Ezekiel 41. I think you guys might find this interesting. I find all this stuff very fascinating. Ezekiel 41. Let's look at 
We well, start verse 15, and I, I can get this, but we're going to especially look at verse 18. Then he measured the length of the building facing the yard that was at the back and its galleries on either side, a hundred cubits, the inside of the nave and the vestibules of the court, the thresholds and the narrow windows and galleries all around, the three of them opposite the threshold were paneled with wood all around them from the floor up to the windows. Uh, now the windows were covered. Now see, this is a physical, actual future temple. And why temple? A lot of times people get wrapped up in temple. Why would you need temple sacrifices? Ah, Jesus is the final sign. We've got to remember the language of the temple in the scriptures throughout is that it's, it's the house of God. So it's his dwelling place more than anything else. It's not so much about the sacrifices. It's where God dwells. So we have a future dwelling place. And we also will find that branch or Messiah himself will have a, a throne in the temple. So we're not used to that. So verse 17, to the space above the door, even to the inner room and to the outside and on all the walls around and inside and outside with a measured pattern, it was carved of cherubim and palm trees, a palm tree between cherub and cherub. Look at this. Every cherub had two faces, a human face toward the palm tree on the one side and on the face of a young lion toward the palm tree on the other side. They were carved uh, on the whole temple all around, even the door to uh, above the door, the cherubim and the palm trees were carved. So evidently there's, there's multiple types. You know, you have cats with stripes, cats without stripes, small cats, large cats. You've got horses. Um, you know, a lot of this kind of stuff is speculation, but we see this and they, and they look different. And these cherubs have two faces. In other places, they have a different number of faces. So you've got all kinds of strangeness going on. You've got four living creatures in Ezekiel, four wings, four f faces. In Revelation, they have six wings and eyes all around. Some of them have four faces on one head, some more four different types of living creatures. They're just all different. But living creatures, I don't think that's necessarily a type. I think that's their nature. They're a living creature, not an angel, but some type of spirit, spiritual being that God has created. So uh, it's like the attributes of God. We know the attributes of God that he's revealed as best we can understand it in the scripture. But is it possible there are attributes of God, things about God that we don't know about, that there are other attributes of God that we're completely unaware of because experientially we don't know what that means and what it, how it presents itself, right? We kind of did Job, but where these angelic beings interact with people in the scripture. And we also see another type of presence in there that you've probably heard of, the angel of the Lord, right? Well, what does it mean a lot of times when we see this personage described in the Old Testament as the angel of the Lord? Usually it's like the pre-incarnate. Uh, right, yeah, so we call it a Christophany or a theophany. Um, yeah, pre-incarnate Christ. We know angels, we're not supposed to worship them. There have been a couple times in the scriptures, you know, like John, fall down and worship and he says, get up, don't do that. I'm, I'm just a servant just like you. I mean, here we have the angel of the Lord. We're going to see places where he's called, referred to repeatedly as Lord. He accepts worship and the behavior is completely different around the angel of the Lord. But we're all, what's also going to come up as we're reading some of these is um, the angel of the Lord. And, and a lot of times what you will see is you will see um, an angel of the Lord or an angel of God and it's just an angel but not always so sometimes you have to keep reading the passages the verses before and after because a lot of times you'll see um, um, you know and I'll send uh, my angel um, before you and the verses will go on and get five to six verses down and, and then it starts describing the angel of the Lord and then he's got this authority and stuff, and you start saying, okay, well, this is referring back to here, so that's actually the same guy. That's the angel of the Lord here. That's pre-incarnate Christ. So it's fascinating to think that God is really hands-on more than just, uh, 
you know, wiggling his nose or his finger to make things happen on the earth and among people, right? He's very hands-on. He, will, he came down here uh, in the form of a man before he came in, in the person of Christ, in the person of Jesus Christ beforehand. So why did he do that? And we'll take a look at what types of circumstances in which he involved himself. And uh, any other, any questions about what we've talked about for the last few weeks? It's kind of a lot, isn't it? Any other questions or anything that we can clear up? I will have more handouts next time. So I hope you take this home and enjoy it, chew on it a little bit, look up some of the references, and, and if you have questions, questions, we'll get into those questions. Then, as I say, the after that, we'll get into, um, it's not my favorite subject, not something that I, I like to spend a lot of time on, but angels and demons, and it's a, a reality we have to deal with. And um, what's really bad about it is is that you really want to get into under some uh, spiritual attack and things like that, and you just spend a little time trying to expose Satan and his demons and their activities and the nature of how they work, and, and your, you know, your world can get rocked that way. I'm not trying to sound all woo-woo or anything. It's just, you know, you ask most pastors, and that's, that can be sometimes the most confusing and roughest times of your life when you can come under some attack is when you're doing this kind of thing, because he doesn't like to be exposed to the light, does he? And his, his forces don't. So we'll get, into, we'll get into that. And then following that, again, we'll, we will get into what, how things wrap up with the angels and the demons, that whole spiritual realm, what that looks like in the future. All right, so with that, um, I'm going to close this up in prayer.